Our message today, as the title suggests, is about how to live in the last days. I remember hearing a story years ago about a couple of night watchmen in England, and they had gathered to talk together during the changing of the guard at midnight. Now, you know what the night watchmen used to do? They used to call them the night criers because they'd walk through the town, and as the big town clock would ring out, you know, 10 o'clock, it would bong 10 times, you know, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and the town crier would say, 10 o'clock and all is well, and then they'd wait another hour. I think that would wake people up, but that's what they did. Then the big town clock would ring 11 times, bong, 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 and after 11 rings, they'd say, 11 o'clock and all is well, and and it, it got just about midnight, and the two town criers got together because they were getting ready to change, and one was going off duty, and one was going on duty, and they were visiting a little bit, and then they got ready for the clock to ring midnight. And it started, bong, bong. And they had done this years before. They counted them in their heads. They knew exactly when it was going to get to 12. But this time, the clock went 10, 11 rings, 12 rings, 13 rings, 14 rings, and it stopped. And they looked at each other, and one of them said, wow, it is later than it has ever been before. <laughs> and that would be true. Wherever we are in history, do you realize that we're one day closer to the second coming of the Lord? Amen. But uh, I might surprise you to tell you that the Bible tells us that the day of the Lord and the nearness of His coming has been near for a long time. Now, first of all, why are we studying the subject? How do you live in the last days? Well, you know, it says in 2 Timothy 3, 1, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Do we see perilous times in the world today? There are dangerous times. And I think everybody knows that at some point, things have to end. It can't go on like this forever. I mean, you just look at what's happening to the world in the environment and the resources that are being consumed so quickly and, and the population that is exploding and the challenges that are going on between economies and, and technology is just, it, it seems like it's accelerating to the point where everything is going to be controlled by robots pretty soon. Um, and you wonder, how long can this last? Jesus said there'll be a time in history when, except those days be, floor, uh, be shortened, no flesh would survive. But we are living in the last days. Let me just tell you that I know we're in the last days because the Bible says we've been in the last days since the Apostle Peter. So we're certainly in the last days now. Did you know that? Let me read you a few verses, and it might surprise you. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Now, what's he talking about? Holy Spirit's poured out at Pentecost. They start speaking in tongues. Peter says, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. It will come to pass in the last days, says the Lord. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Well, I think Joel's prophecy may be a dual prophecy. Holy Spirit poured out during the former reign, and it'll be poured out again during the latter reign. But Peter said, it's going to come to pass in the last days. Hebrews 1. Chapter 1, verse 1, listen. God, who at various times and various ways spoke in the past to our fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, look at that, Paul said 2,000 years ago, here we are in the last days. Isn't that what it says? God has in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He's appointed heir of all things, through whom He made the worlds. And then you look in James, chapter 5, verse 8. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, why did they say the coming of the Lord was at hand 2,000 years ago? Were they misinformed? Well, first of all, Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. That means the apostles did not know the day or the hour. Is that safe to say? They did not know it's 2,000 years away. They knew it could come at any point, not because God had pinned a date on his calendar, but something needed to happen before he returned. Another way to consider this is when Jesus came and he completed his mission, you know, it was the, the life, the teachings, the sacrifice, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension to heaven, 
that marked a change. Would we all agree something changed when Jesus did all that in the economy of the gospel? What changed is up until that time, he started preaching. Jesus started preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist is preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The spiritual kingdom was available when Jesus came because he died and paid the penalty for the sins of the world. He was successful in his mission. Now, that's different from the physical kingdom being at hand. There is going to be a time when God's physical kingdom is going to be here in the world. He's going to physically come. The earth is going to implode and the trumpet will blast and the angels will come and the dead will rise and history in our world will end at that point. There's going to be a time in history. But the disciples believe that the end was even back then. Look at this. 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Meaning God had done everything he needed to do to save men with the sacrifice of Jesus. It was all complete. Let me give you another one. 1 John 2, 18. Little children, it is the last hour. <laughs> so here you got Peter, James, and John. They're all saying it. Little children, it is the last hour, and you've heard that Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come. And that's how we know it is the last hour. So look at the language. Last days, last hour, end of all things. But does that mean that they were wrong? Well, keep in mind God says in 1 Peter, no, sorry, 2 Peter, chapter, two, uh, chapter 3, verse 8, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. So if you're God and you live zillions of years without end, how long is a thousand years? Well, it's even less than a day for him, but he wanted to give us some idea to comprehend it. He said it's like a day. So if you've got the first 4,000 years and then Jesus comes... If you get 2,000 years from his first coming to his second coming, which puts us at where we're at today, do you realize if you go back exactly 2,000 years from where you are today, Jesus was alive walking the earth. You're somewhere right now between his birth and his death. So what is two days? You're in the last days, so you get two left. Otherwise, you'd say, I'm in the last day. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Another reason to keep it that, what about your life? How long do we live? For what is your life, James 4.14? Is it even a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away? Someone interviewed Billy Graham near the end of his life and they said, what is it that has most impressed you about life? He said, it's brevity. And here's a guy that was 99 years old. And he said, it's so brief. It seems like all of a sudden you're looking back and say, I thought I was young. What happened? Now I'm trying to find a place in the cemetery. Our life is like a vapor. So if God says, behold, the day of the Lord is at hand and his coming is near, well, if for no other reason, your life is short, it's near. And the uh, longer you live, the nearer it gets. Right? So uh, we've got to keep this in our perspective. Uh, now, We've always sort of been in the last days in that respect, but there is a time near the end where you are actually entering the final phases of prophecy. There are also some scriptures where Jesus made it very clear that his coming was not as soon as you might think. If you look in Matthew chapter 24, he's talking there about the signs of his return. You read in Matthew 24, verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. All these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. Here's Jesus saying, don't think this is it. I mean, back during World War II when the bomb fell on Hiroshima, didn't people say, this is it? And uh, yeah, people were thinking, this is it. Back with Y2K, you remember that? And others thought when the Twin Towers were bombed, 9-11, this is it. It did look kind of apocalyptic if you watched that on the news. And God said, uh, don't be troubled. There's things that have to happen first. That's what Jesus said. And then Paul, thankfully, if you look in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he makes it pretty clear that there's some other things that need to happen before the end takes place. 
You can look in chapter 2, verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, speaking of the day of the Lord, will not come unless there comes a falling away first. He didn't mean a falling away in the world because the world is already fallen. He's talking about falling away in the church. That's when John says many antichrists are coming, yet they've already started. A falling away had already begun in the church. And of course, you get the ultimate antichrist that reigned for 1,200 years. God's very patient. His patience surprises us sometimes. Um, it's a challenge when you're a Christian and you're planning because you need to plan for a thousand years, but you need to live like you could die tomorrow. Isn't that right? When we build our building up on the hill, we're not wanting to use the cheapest materials thinking, oh, well, Jesus is going to come in 20 years, so let's save some money. No, you're wanting to build it because you want to be faithful and do it as though it's something that's going to last. So I'm going to be looking at uh, several points here as I consider now how to live. First, I wanted to establish we are in the last days. We've been in the last days a long time. And I got seven points in case you want to track. And here's the key to how to live in the last days. Learn diligently, look prayerfully, long eagerly, live purely, lean totally, labor actively, and loving fully. So if you want to leave now, you can. You know what I'm going to say. They say that the uh, key to a good sermon is tell people what you're going to say, say it, and tell, it, tell them what it is you said. <laughs> All right, let's talk about learning diligently. So how do we live in the last days? We need to know what's going on. The foundation for the Christian faith is the Bible. We need to be learning diligently. The Bible says we not only need to be learning personally, we need to be teaching the Word to our children. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 and 7, These words that I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them how diligently to your children. You should talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lay down, when you rise up. They should be signs on your hand, frontlets between your eyes, on your doorpost. Surround yourself with the Word of God. You know why that's so important in our day? Your worldview your attitude and whole uh, perspective of life is going to be built on a worldview. That means what you think about abortion is going to be based on your worldview. Uh, what you think about a uh, oh, broad spectrum of moral issues, it's all going to be guided. What you think about war, what you think about forgiveness, what you think about finances, what you think about careers, what you think about everything is going to be governed by a worldview. If your worldview is a Christian worldview, that we are here temporarily, that the purpose of life is to know God and His love and to share God and His love, and that this life is really short compared to eternity, that affects all your decisions. If you don't have a biblical worldview, you have entirely different decision process. For you, everything is about now. What am I going to get now in this life, in this world? instead of thinking about eternity. You're thinking about pleasing yourself instead of thinking about pleasing of God. You, you'll live a secret life because you think no one will know, forgetting angels are always watching. Your biblical worldview affects everything you do. So we need to be reading the Word of God and developing a biblical worldview and teaching it to our children. Nehemiah, it tells us that uh, when they came out of Babylon, all the people came together they stood up, Ezra read to them from the book of the law. That's why we stand when we read the scriptures because of this passage. And it says the priests were there to help them get understanding of what they read. Men, women, children, they all came together. They were taught the word of God and then they explained it. They expounded it. Psalm 119. Well, if you want to know the importance of learning, read Psalm 119. I venture to guess nobody here has memorized Psalm 119. Some may have memorized the 23rd Psalm. If you want to memorize Psalm 117, that's not very hard. It's a short, that's the shortest Psalm. But Psalm 119 is all about the importance of the Word of God. Here's one little snippet. Verse 97 through 99. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. It's talking about the Word of God. Through your commandments, you make me wiser than my enemies. They are ever with me. 
I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Christians that go to college sometimes understand more than their teachers if they're Christians and their professors are not. Some believe there's no God. And the Bible says the fool says in his heart there's no God. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to study. Is studying the Word of God part of your regular pattern in your life? Did you figure out, well, I go to church once a week, that covers me? No. We need to know what we believe. The Bible tells us, Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin. Our problem is with sin. What's our biggest defense against sin? Thy word. What did Jesus use to fight sin? It is written, it is written, it is written. If the Son of God, your Savior, needed the Word of God to fight the devil, do you think you're better equipped than he was? How are we going to make it if we're not learning diligently? So that's one way we're going to survive in the last days. Study the Word. Looking prayerfully. Now, I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Part of any message like this, I'm going to have three things I'm going to say. The three things are going to say, Bible, prayer, share. If you're going through the sanctuary in this church, most of us are acquainted with that temple in ancient Israel and, and uh, the temple in heaven. You've got the holy place. There were three things in the holy place. You remember what they were? A table with bread, an altar of incense, and a lampstand with seven candle lights. Those three things are the key to getting into the Holy of Holies, the presence of God. If you want to go to heaven. The three disciplines in the Christian life, you need to pray. That's that altar of incense. The bread, the word is the bread. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word. You need the bread of life, the Bible. And you also need to share your faith. The Bible says, let your light shine before men. And so being a witness in your life. Those are three things that are foundational. If you want to have spiritual health, you need to breathe, you need to eat, you need to exercise. Breathing is prayer, eating the Word of God, exercising, sharing your faith. These are laws that you can't violate. There'll be consequences. Show me a backslidden Christian and I will show you somebody who is neglecting one of those three things. So you need to take time for not only reading the Word, but for prayer. And that's a diligent prayer, looking prayerfully. Titus 2.13, when we think about the second coming, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, how is it that we look in prayer? Jesus tells us, Mark 13, 33, take heed, watch, and pray, for you don't know what that time is of your Lord's appearing. Watch and pray. What's a watchful prayer? It means a persistent prayer. Heard a story about a lady that went to this opera and she was, you know, it was one of these ritzy glitzy things and a and, uh, wealthy person, lady there and, and taking off her coat, she knocked off her brooch and it fell down between the seats and she got home and discovered that her very expensive gold diamond encrusted brooch had fallen off. This is many years ago. So she calls the... Uh, she calls the theater and she asks the attendant there. She talked to the manager and said, I, I lost this brooch. And she gave the approximate area where she was seating. He said, well, ma'am, hold the phone and I'll go find it for you. So he held the phone and it took him a little while. He went up and down the aisles. Pretty soon he looked between the seats and looked under the seats and he found the brooch. He came back and he said, I've got good news. Hello? Hello? She got tired of waiting. She hung up. Never gave her name. Never called back. Got tired of waiting. She lost the treasure. <laughs> I wonder how many times we lose a treasure God wants to give us because we do not look prayerfully. We do not watch and wait. You've got to wait upon the Lord in your prayers. It's not just talking. And sometimes it's listening. Another verse. Same chapter. Mark 13. Go to verse 35. Watch, therefore, you do not know when the master of the house is coming. Jesus said that all along. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest I come suddenly, he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Now, notice what the Lord is saying. 
You need to watch and pray. You don't know when I'm coming. Could be morning, could be night, could be midnight, could be when the rooster crows. So we're to be living in a constant attitude of watchfulness. Watch and pray, watch and pray. How sad it would be to go to sleep at that time, that crucial moment. 1 Peter 4, 7, I already mentioned this to you, but the end of all things is at hand. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. I mean, serious about the things of God. King James says, be sober-minded. I mean, eternity is at stake. It doesn't mean you can never laugh. It means that we need to make sure and keep the main thing the main thing, have the priorities. Prayer is as important to the Christian as breathing is to your body. We should be living in an attitude of prayer. You, you know, you have been, whether you're aware of it or not, I know something personal about you. You have been breathing your whole life with very few interruptions. The Bible says pray without ceasing. We should be living in an attitude of walking with God and communing with Him. Those are the people who will be ready when Christ comes. The Bible says Noah walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, was translated. You and I, living in the last generation, the church of Laodicea, can be translated, but we must also walk with God. Luke 21, 36, Watch therefore and pray always. How often do we watch and pray? Pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. What things is he talking about? Luke 21, he's talking about the signs of the end, the calamities and troubles of the last days. We're to watch and pray always that we might be worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man when He comes in His glory. So that's very clear that one of the things we should do in being prepared for the last days, pray. Have a life of prayer. Set times. You might be thinking, well, I'm not very good at this praying business. Prayer is something that you learn. Even the apostles went to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray as John taught. Don't feel bad. I thought prayer was spiritual. You just feel it and kind of just do it from the heart. No, there's ways that are right ways to pray and there's wrong ways to pray. And so you can be taught to pray. Get some good books on prayer. Karen and I are reading a really good book on prayer. It's a big book. We've been reading it for weeks in our worship, but it's good. And it's E.M. Bounds, in case you're wondering. A great book. It's everything E.M. Bounds ever wrote about prayer all in one book. <laughs> it's really good, but it's helping me realize how much I've got to learn about prayer, especially for those living on the threshold of eternity. We should know how to pray, not just for ourselves, but for the church, for revival. Amen? All right. We talked about learning diligently, looking prayerfully, longing eagerly. Whatever you do, do with all your might. Christians ought to have enthusiasm. Amen? If we were more enthusiastic about what we, you know what, you know what theos means? It means God. Theology. Enthusiasm means a person who is in God. And God, nothing should excite you more than God, right? The Bible tells us how we should live about what our attitude should be about the second coming. Philippians 3.20 for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. You ever seen a dog when their master leaves? They go to the screen door, they go to the window, and they just can't wait for them to come home, and their eyes are open, their ears are up, their, all their senses are, when are they coming, when are they coming, when are they coming, you know? And uh, that's how the Christian ought to be about the Lord's return. I mean, we are eagerly looking for it. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.7. So that you do not come short in any gift, eagerly awaiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. People will wonder, why are you so excited? You say, Jesus is coming. <laughs> you, you know, you're, you're, you can't wait for it. <laughs> My master is coming home. <laughs> right? Christians ought to be excited. About it. And you know, your enthusiasm will be contagious. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear. Not to everybody, but to who? The enthusiastic. If you're just kind of Laodicean about Jesus coming, oh yeah, he's coming again. And you know, it's kind of sad, but the very word, we're a Seventh-day Adventist church, the very word Adventist implies people who are believing in and looking for the imminent return of Jesus. And we live in such a way that we believe and act like the Lord is coming. And we're eager for it to happen. 
Now, if I ask you, do you want the Lord to come? You probably say, oh, amen. But in your heart of hearts, some of you are thinking, ah, but not yet. For a couple of reasons. Some of you think, well, I'm hoping I can get ready first and I'm not ready now. Well, you better get ready because you don't know when that's going to be. Someone asked a rabbi, what's the best time to repent? He said, the last day of your life. And the guy said, well, what if you don't know when that is? He said, exactly. <laughs> so we should be ready always, right? Adventists who believe in the coming ought to be living in this, this spirit of expectancy. G. Campbell Morgan wrote, to me, the second coming is the perpetual light in the path which makes the present bearable. I never lay my head on a pillow without thinking that maybe before morning breaks, the final morning will have dawned. I never begin my work without thinking perhaps he may interrupt my work and begin his own. We should live every day in the idea that we're only a breath away from eternity. If you die... If for some reason the car slips into your lane or anything could happen, I don't want to scare you, but it's a sobering thought. Your next conscious thought is the resurrection. You want to be ready. Now, I started that. Maybe we all want the Lord to come. Sometimes we're thinking, ah, not yet. I, some things, Lord, I still like to get straight. I don't really feel like I'm ready, fully committed. We'll get committed. The other reason sometimes we hesitate is we have loved ones. There's people we want to reach. And you know, if the Lord comes right now, they're not ready. And you want them to be ready. But don't let those things keep you from praying for the glorious return of Christ. Indeed, how does the Bible end? You ever notice that there in Revelation? What is the final appeal of the Apostle John in the Bible? Even the Lord says, Behold, I come quickly. And John says, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Shouldn't that be our desire? John wrote the book of Revelation. He'd been a prisoner. He'd watched many of his friends killed for their faith. The evil despot Nero was uh, persecuting Christians. And when John said, even so, come Lord Jesus, I mean, he, he really was praying. It was in his heart. Someone said, you cannot kindle a fire in the heart of someone else until it's burning in your own heart. Amen. So not only should we be looking for him eagerly, we should be living purely. This is talking about holiness. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, he's talking about the second coming, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. As he is. Notice this. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself or purifies herself just as he is pure. How pure? Just as he is pure. Christians are followers of Christ. Our desire, our goal is to reflect his holiness. Did that scare you? That's what the Bible teaches. Hebrews 12, verse 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. Without holiness, nobody will see the Lord. We ought to be praying that God can make us holy. Be ye holy, he said. New and Old Testament. For I am holy. God is calling for us to do that. And that would mean, Psalm 101, verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes, whether it's on TV or on your smartphone. We should turn away from beholding things that are not pure and stop our ears from listening to violence, the Bible says. Job 31.1, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I behold or look upon a young woman? There's a big problem with immorality, not just the, the epidemic of pornography, but it's on billboards in town. A Christian needs to make a covenant with her eyes. God is calling us to purity and holiness. Do you want me to talk like this? Yes. How do you get ready for the last days? You know, it is so easy for us, and I have to constantly remind myself, it's easy for us to applaud ourselves as Christians. If we are even lukewarm Christians, a lukewarm Christian today is light years ahead of the morality of the world. And so you can deceive yourself into thinking, well, I'm so much better than this wicked world 
that you think your lukewarmness will get you into heaven. It doesn't work that way. God does not grade on the curve. He doesn't say, well, as long as you're 10% better than the wicked world, you'll make it. He said, the wicked world is not your example. Jesus is your example. And he's calling us to holiness, to be ready for his return. You know, I remember uh, hearing a story. A guy kept homing pigeons. And, you know, it's just, it's a whole uh, sport. And people, they, they breed them. There's all different kinds, all different colors. And sometimes they pay thousands of dollars for them. And they, they've got this network of friends around the country. And they're usually, they got a place where they got a yard full of pins and pigeons. And this one guy was in a city in Ohio. And up on the roof in this town, he had his pigeons and he would tie little messages and let them go. And uh, they had been shipped to him and they would fly back to their owners. And I don't know why they do that, but they have fun with it. And uh, this one fellow was up on his roof in Ohio visiting. And while they were talking on the roof and he was showing him his different homing pigeons, this bird fluttered in. He said, will you look at this? He said, this pigeon just flew 500 miles from St. Louis and he didn't land once. And the guy said to him, how in the world do you know the pigeon didn't land once? Did that pigeon just tell you that he came straight in and he didn't land once? So no, see, I can just look at him and tell he didn't land. He said he went from his keeper directly to me because he wanted to get home. He was so anxious to get home to me. He didn't get distracted. He didn't land. He said because his feet are clean, his wings are clean, there's no pollen on his wings, there's no mud on his feet. All he'd think about was getting to me. And you know, that's what the Lord is calling us to do. He's, we are so focused and so eager on Jesus coming that we don't get distracted with the world. You make a beeline to your master. He's calling us to purity. There was a, uh, a surgeon in this congregation and, and uh, he was, you know, wealthy and kind of half-hearted about his faith and he went to the doctor one day, uh, he, the doctor went to the uh, pastor one day, and he says, here's a, I got a couple tickets for a, a Broadway show here in town. You'll really enjoy this. And the pastor said, that's very thoughtful of you. He said, but I can't accept that. He said, why not? You, you need to relax. You work too hard. Just enjoy yourself. God wants you to have some fun. And he knew what kind of play it was. And he said, uh, doctor, he said, uh, would you operate with dirty hands? Of course not. He said, I can't do my work with a dirty heart. But that's not just true of pastors. That should be true of every believer. We've got a work to do, and you can't do it very well with a dirty heart. He's calling us to be pure, and so we've got to be careful what we look at, what we think about. It's not only living purely, it's leaning totally. The just will live by their faith. Proverbs 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. You need to have a faith that is entirely leaning on the Lord in the last days if you want to be ready. Know what it means to live by faith. John 13, 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Do you lean on the Lord? You know, they got that song, lean on me. That's what Jesus really wants us to do. Lean on him. When Caleb said to the children of Israel, I know that we can get into the promised land because the God that brought us this far can bring us all the way. When David went against Goliath, he said, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come against you with the Lord. I am leaning entirely on God. And this whole process of this um, church construction process, it, it's been a big job. It's taken a long time. And there have been so many times where I've been tempted to pull my hair out, obviously. But uh, I, I just said, Lord, this is not my church. <laughs> this is your church. Pastor Ross and I were talking this week. We had some challenges with being able to stay here and how long we're going to stay here. And, and I told John, I said, I'm glad this is God's problem because I don't know how he's going to work it out. And it looks like he's working it out. Uh, so you've got to just put things in God's hands. Jesus doesn't want us to live in fear. He said, where is your faith? He wants us to be holy, but he wants us to be at peace and trust him. We need to trust that he will finish the work he began in our lives. 
Otherwise, we're going to be anxious all the time, totally casting our faith upon Him. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, We who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice Peter's talking about the last time. How are you able to be prepared for the last time? You are kept by the power of God. How? Through faith. We need to be a people that are a people of faith. We need to demonstrate our faith in God. When people see us tested, we need to show and witness through our trials that we trust God. And God will work miracles for us to teach them. When Christians look like they get a really bad medical report and they trust in God and then they're healed. You're being a witness through your faith. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all of your care upon him because he cares for you. Peter knew about that. You know, he saw Jesus walk on water. When Peter lost faith, he began to sink. Someone once said, faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. F.B. Meyer said, unbelief, lack of faith, puts our circumstances between us and God. But faith puts God between us and our problems. So whatever your problems are, cast them on the Lord, lean on God, and we're going to need faith. Point six, not only living purely and leaning totally, laboring actively. I told you the three things. One is letting your light shine. We need more love in our heart to melt the lead in our feet and get out and tell our neighbors. Luke 10, verse 2, Jesus said, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are what? Few. There are a lot more people out there that want to know about Jesus and what you believe than people in the church that want to tell them. I know it's hard to believe. We think, oh, it's so hard to get people to come to church. The reason it's hard is we're not telling them. It's not that hard. If we will share with our neighbors, if we will do, use our gifts to share the gospel, and I'm kind of preaching to the choir because we've got a pretty active church, y'all. We're really proud of you, but I know there's others listening. So I wasn't telling you. I'm telling them <laughs> that we've got to be involved in doing evangelism. Someone once said, God alone can save the world, but God can't save the world alone. I know that might sound, oh, well, can't God do anything? He's not going to save the world without our cooperation. Even the angels told the shepherds when Jesus came the first time so they could tell others. The angels told the wise men so they could tell others. God tells us because he's going to use us in telling others. Even when the Lord appeared personally to Paul, Paul said, now what do I want to, what am I supposed to do? God said, well, hang around. I'll have someone come tell you. God uses people to reach people. He told the disciples, go ye into all the world, teach. He wants us to share the good news and share the Christian view. Is the second coming determined? Now, here I want to, I'm going to kind of pause before I get to my last point. And I just want to make it very, very clear. Has God fixed a date for the second coming? That's a different question from, does God know the date of the second coming? Does God know everything? Yeah. But is the second coming determined by a calendar God has or is the second coming determined by something happening here on earth? Didn't Jesus say the gospel will be preached in all the world, Matthew 24, 14. The gospel will be preached in all the world for witness to all nations. Then the end will come. He said something needs to happen, right? So is there something we can do to hasten the last days? I want you to notice a verse. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. Therefore, talking about how to live in the last days, Peter says the heavens will dissolve with fervent heat. The earth and the things that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all of these things will be dissolved, well, everything in the world is going to burn up, what manner of persons ought you be in all holy conduct, we talked about that, and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming? Wait. Hastening? We can hasten? There's something we can do to hasten? the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens being dissolved are on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. According to the Greek translation, that word hastening means we are expediting the arrival of the day of God. We can do something 
to help prepare the environment by preparing hearts to accelerate that day. So if you want Jesus to come, prove it. There's something we can do to help speed that along. Do you realize that Christ could have come before now? Did God intend for the children of Israel to wander, wander 40 years in the wilderness? You know, he saves them miraculously from Egypt. He gets them out in the wilderness. He says, I don't know how to tell you guys this, but I'm going to make you walk through the desert for 40 years. Then I'll take you to the promised land. That wasn't his plan. He brought them to the borders of the promised land, intending to bring them into the promised land, but they lost faith on the borders of the promised land. They weren't prepared, and so they wandered. That was not God's ideal plan. That's why we pray, thy will be done, because a lot of things that happen are not God's will. Was it God's intention that we be here as long as we are now? You know, if the early church had continued the revival that began with the apostles, Jesus would have come before now. If the Seventh-day Adventist movement had done what they were supposed to do during that revival following 1844, he would have been here. Let me read something to you from Christ Object Lessons, page 69, that classic book. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It's the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We all who profess his name, bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened. Christ would come. You go to page 37. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. So when I say that we're living in the last days and the Lord is coming soon, that's a conditional statement. He could come a little sooner or a little later. And there's, no matter what the world does, there's going to be a day when the curtain's going to fall. Right? I think we all agree. But there's something we could do to accelerate it. We can hasten the Lord's coming by godly living, Peter said, by sharing our faith. Then I want to get to the last point here. Loving fully. Matthew 22, verse 37. You should love the Lord your God. Someone said, what's the great commandment? What's the greatest thing? How should we live in the last days? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, for the love of Christ compels us. Why do we want to share the loss? Why do we want to live holy? We love him because he first loved us. The love of Christ compels us because we judge thus if one died for all, then all died. Colossians 3, 14, but above all these things, here he's taking you to the top shelf, Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. If you want to know if a church is ready for the second coming, the Bible says all men will know that you are my disciples by what? Your prophetic understanding. By your zeal for religious law. All men will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And we prove our love for God by saying over and over, you've got to say a hundred times over and over, I love you, God. Is that how you do it? We prove it, the Bible says, by showing love to each other. And you know how that happens? God puts us in situations where our love for others is challenged. It often begins at home. <laughs> and then we demonstrate our love for God by loving our neighbor. It all has to start with love for God, right? But above all these things, put on love. 1 Peter 4, 8. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. Notice what Peter says. For love will cover a multitude of sins. When we don't have love, we go and we advertise people's faults. But love covers. Aren't you glad that the love of God, he's willing to cover your sins with his blood? Makes me think of a story in the Bible. Noah, walk with God, good man. But after the flood, Noah started farming grapes. Maybe he didn't know what happened if the grape juice sat too long, but it fermented. And he thought, oh, well, I, this is kind of nice. It makes me relax. Or, but he got way too relaxed one day. And it says he was stumbling around 
And you know, if, if, if Noah realized that alcohol could mess you up, then we should all be aware of that. Noah couldn't control it. Nobody really can. Started stumbling around drunk in his tent, naked. He was carrying on. And one of his sons, Ham, walked in. And instead of trying to just cover his father up and respecting his condition and keeping it to himself, he went out of the tent and began to tell everybody in the camp, oh, our patriarch is stumbling around drunk in his tent and he's naked. Come and see. Well, when his brothers heard that, the Bible says, do you not dishonor your mother and your father. They said, you should respect him. Shem and Japheth, they took a garment. They walked into the tent. They walked in backwards out of respect for the father. They didn't even want that picture in their mind. They walked in backwards. They laid something over him. They covered him. Love covers. Doesn't, it doesn't mean it condones sin, but it wants to protect. It wants to save. The Bible says love will cover a multitude of sins. 1 John 3.11 for this is the message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Someone said at one point, count a day lost which you have not tried to do something kind for someone else. And love has converted more sinners than either zeal, eloquence, or learning. You know what the most effective thing in reaching the lost is? Love. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, you know this. Now abides faith hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is what? It's love. Let me tell you a love story. Jack took a liking to a young lady he was working with. Her name was Mary. It's a true story. He was very shy. Jack didn't know where to start, so he talked to a local florist, and he had them deliver a single red rose to Mary, which they did. She didn't know who it came from. No note. Now, this went on every day for four days. At that point, her curiosity was really getting to her. Rose was showing up uh, via delivery every day, and she's wondering. She went to the florist and said, well, who is delivering this rose? And the guy wasn't supposed to say, but he said, I think it's some guy named Jack that works with you. She said, ah, oh, I think I know who that is. She came to him with the rose and said, what's going on? He said, well, I wanted to ask you out, but I was afraid, and I just thought I'd soften you up send you some flowers. And so she said, I'll go out with you. He's a nice guy. So she went out with him. And while she's going out with him, he still continued to send a rose every day. And uh, eventually, he proposed. She accepted. They got married. Still, he sent a rose every day. During the honeymoon, she thought it all stopped. But during the honeymoon, he arranged one red rose came every day. But then, of course, after a honeymoon, we all know that all that stuff goes away, right? <laughs> Maybe it's not supposed to. <laughs> she was shocked when she got home, got back to work. Uh, he continued, a rose every day. And after 47 years of marriage, a rose appeared every single day. Finally, Jack died. The day after the funeral, someone knocked at the door with a red rose. And she figured, well, word hasn't reached. She, he probably had a standing order, and word hasn't reached him. She said, you realize that Jack died, and, and you don't need to do this anymore. He said, oh, miss, you misunderstand. Um, your husband made arrangements for you to receive a red rose every day for the rest of your life because he never wants you to forget how much he loves you. By the way, his name was Jack Benny. And his wife was Mary Livingston. And she lived nine more years after that. And a rose came to her every day. You know, the Bible says, love never fails. And the, one of the most important things that we could learn in preparing for the last days is love. If you love God more, you will serve him better. If you love God more, you'll read about him better. If you love God more, you will pray better. You will do more to share your faith of course, the Bible is the one where as we learn more about God, we love Him more. I think we're living in the last days and we want to be ready. We want to be faithful. Amen? Amen. 